Lesson number 10. When shall these things be? We are to study Matthew 24 and 25. Which means, of course, that we have got to hang on and race through. Matthew 24 opens with a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. They were on the Mount of Olives, looking over the city of Jerusalem, and the disciples pointed out to Christ the wonderful buildings that Herod was erecting, especially his great stones. Herod loved big stones, big, big stones. If you ever go to the Holy Land, look up some of these huge stones. Christ said the day was coming in which not one would be left upon another. And then the disciples asked a double battle question. When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming at the end of the world? And I've learned from this double question never to ask double questions because the answers get very complicated. And Christ answered that double question in Matthew 24. So we have got to sort out the parts of it that apply locally to the destruction of Jerusalem and the parts that apply to last day events. In the first section, verses 4 through 14, Christ emphasized Several times, the need to beware. Take heed that no man deceive you. He said this over and over again. One of the signs of the end are deceiving preachers, charlatans. They are always the nicest, kindest, gentlest, most Christian people you'll meet. But that has nothing to do with their deceptive power. The most beautiful creature in the Garden of Eden, the most beautiful angel in heaven, was the devil himself. Don't let anyone deceive you. Then he gave signs. And we can pick these signs up and apply them through the typical fall of Jerusalem to the end time. Wars, rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kindred against kindred, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, signs in the sun, moon, and stars, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. We could take each one of these signs and write the chapter of a book on them. There have always been wars, but these are sign wars. Never liked them before. There have always been earthquakes, there have always been all these other things, but we are going to see sign earthquakes, sign famines, where tens of millions of people are going to die. In the West, we don't notice them. Some years ago, there was a contrived famine in Bangladesh where five million people died. It made about three lines on page 74 of some newspaper. These are signs that Christ is coming and those signs are abundant. Then Christ made a very memorable statement, verses 15, 16, on through 20. The gospel is going to be preached in all the world. We are witnessing that right now. The prophecies of Daniel may be understood and will be fulfilled and will act as a dynamic 
then flee, do something about it. So the only book that he quoted by name in giving the signs of the end was the book of Daniel. He says he's a prophet, read it, understand it, do something about it. And we Seventh-day Adventists are very interested and we know something about the prophecies of Daniel. Now we must do something about it. He mentions then the tribulation of the Dark Ages. Millions of people that were done to death by religious legislation. Time of, of abomination that caused desolation. Destroying, killing. If those days hadn't been shortened, no flesh would have been saved. But by the end of the, by the middle of the 18th century, persecution had well nigh died away, and then there would come a great earthquake, the sun would be dark, the moon would be the color of blood, and the stars would fall. So we go 1755, 1780, 1833. We've seen those signs fulfilled. Don't let anyone fool you, he says. I've told you before. Don't listen to any false messiah, false Christ, for Christ is going to return and when he comes, he'll come like lightning. The next section deals with the coming of the Son of Man. As lightning shines in darkness, so Christ will appear. He will appear in heaven. He'll appear with power and great glory. When he appears, the voice of the trump of God will bring the dead to life. Don't listen to somebody saying, he's come in the desert, he's come in a seance room. I am Christ. Don't listen to these people. Every eye is going to see him. As the vast procession of the returning Christ passes through stellar space, they move out of their courses to let that great concourse through. Every eye will see him. I don't know how many days he will take to come, but as the earth revolves, they will see him coming near and near. Then we are to believe and rejoice and say, this is our God. We have waited for him. We haven't been fooled by those people who say, lo here, lo there. We've waited for him, and he will save us. The next section of the lesson deals with uh, the beginning of Christ's statement for getting ready. He spends more time emphasizing this than the signs. He mentions Noah. As in the days of Noah, some were taken, some were left. The wicked are taken, the righteous are left. As it was in the days of Lot, Sodom, Gomorrah, fire came down, destroyed them. Some were taken, the righteous are left. Then he says, two will be in the field, two will be in a bed, two will be working, one will be taken, the other left. The wicked are taken. This idea of a secret rapture is satanic rubbish. In Luke, the disciples asked Christ, Where? And he says, Where the bodies are gathered together, there the eagles will be. They knew precisely where they'd be left. They'd be left in bed. They'd be left working at a mill. They would be left plowing in a field. They wanted to know where they'd be taken. And so Jesus says, where the carcasses are, there the buzzards will be called. And we get that in Revelation chapter 19. Come, eat the flesh of kings and captains. But when this takes place, be ye ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man will come. Who is the faithful servant? The Lord will make him ruler over many. And then he gave a parable. In chapter 25, the master who went out and called his servants before he left and gave them various gifts, talents, said, occupy 
till I come. 5, 2, and 1. And then, in process of time, he returned. Now, this is the judgment. He required of those servants some products of their work. First one who had received five said, I've got another five. Here's ten. Well done. Be ruler over ten cities. Another one had two. And he said, I've got two more. And he said, well done. I'll make you ruler over four cities. Well, he finished with four, with fewer than the other man began. He began with five. But the reward is the same. He had already told the parable of the penny a day. Doesn't matter how long. Doesn't matter how much endurance. He will give a penny and the penny is eternal life. And so he says he will, he will, when he comes, he'll find them doing, he shall make them ruler over his goods. But there was that evil servant who said, I've only got one. I've got a tough master. I'm not going to do what he wants. I'm going to bury it in the earth. Now sometimes we imagine he dug a hole. But I like to imagine that he utilized it for the things of the earth. Here of the earth, earthy. You do mind earthly things. Somebody is buried in his hobby, buried in his books, buried in his computer. And so he took this talent and he buried it in the earth didn't have anything to show, and he was cast out. Now there are another group of servants who say, my Lord delayeth his coming. You know, I'm always awkward. I feel awkward when I hear my brethren say, the Lord is delaying his coming. It's the wicked servants who say, my Lord is delaying his coming. To say my Lord is delaying his coming presupposes that I know when he should have come. You, you can't say he's delaying if you don't know when he should have come. And I don't know. Such an hour as he think not, son of man comes. So what's the use of saying he's delaying his coming? Think about it. Now in preparation for the coming of Christ, he gave the parable of the virgin. Five were wise and five were foolish. Ellen White says, I was shown that the five foolish virgins represent the Laodicean state. The Laodicean state is a condition of five foolish virgins in the church. The church also has five wise virgins. They're not 100% either Laodicean or foolish. Their problem, the problem of the foolish ones, is they don't have enough oil. They have the vessels, they are virgins, they profess a pure religion. Great controversy defines this kind of virginity. But they don't have the Holy Spirit. And the need is, while you have time, before Christ comes, get all the oil of the Holy Spirit you need. The merchantman is ready to give the oil of discernment, to discern good and bad, for the myopia of the Laodicean state. The last part of our study this week deals with the sheep and goat. There are only two classes. No grays in between. We are either following the good shepherd and are his sheep, or we are goats and are cast out. The importance of Matthew 24 and 25 cannot be emphasized enough. Let's read, study, and be ready.